it's not that I don't have faith in the Lord. It's not that I do not trust in His deliverance of His message. It's, it's more of, of my failure and me getting in the way because we know when God's involved, everything's good, right? Amen. For God is good all the time. and all the time. God. Amen. So I trust that I will get out of the way and the Lord will present to us this morning what He would have us to hear. I also believe that if the church is not praying for me, I shall not be successful. So I covet your prayers as we go through the message this morning and um, that the Lord would uh, keep me in my place where He wants me to be and the words that are spoken will be not only encouraging to you, but they will be encouraging to me too. One of the funny things about uh, giving messages from the pulpit is, and Brother Barry can probably attest to this as well, is there's often times we are learning as we are giving the message. And God is revealing things that are profound, at least in my heart and mind. And we're like, why didn't I see that before? And why am I seeing it in front of 50 to 100 people? <laughs> But that's just the way God works. And I believe that fulfills the Scriptures when it says, Take no thought for what you'll say, for God will give you the words to speak. Because sometimes if we think too much, we speak what we want to say. And we don't hear what God wants to say. I do want to uh, kind of continue on a little bit of the theme that Barry set forth for us last night. And it's about the riches that God does give us. And I wonder how thankful we are for those riches, how precious they are, and what it took for us to receive them. See, we are a people who are born into sin, and we deserve nothing that God gives us, but it is by His, His love, His grace, His mercy, and His forgiveness through His righteous blood that we can be a part of Him. It is not of ourselves. It is a gift from God. I think it'd be good if we consider some scriptures this morning and also consider what it took for us to receive such a gift. Let's go to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and verse 1. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and verse 1. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. What is the cloud of witness? Is it some actual cloud that, that sits around us? Or is there something to this witness? Is it something that we can feel and touch and see? I believe that it is. If you look in the scriptures in the previous chapter that, that this is kind of alluding to, in chapter 11 of Hebrews, it tells us about all of those in the Old Testament who stood strong for the Lord, who set their lives aside to walk the path that God laid before them. Consider Moses. Moses, who was, uh, first of all, saved by God by being sent down the Nile River and taken up by the Egyptians to um, raise him. As he was growing, he realized who he was in his heritage. And he turned down all of the riches of Egypt, the life of luxury, to follow after the one true God. He went out into the wilderness and uh, found a family or created a family. And was asked to leave his family behind to go and to lead the children out of Israel. Spent 40 years of his life when he could have been doing something else to help them get to where God promised them they would go. Now that's a pretty good witness to me. That is a great cloud of witness. And folks, whenever we consider those things like, like even David and Daniel and uh, the prophets and all those of the old scriptures, we even go into the new scriptures where we look at the witness of the apostles and the ultimate witness of our Lord and Savior Jesus, Jesus Christ who gave not only his life as he lived, but his life on the cross. Now that, to me, is a great cloud of witness. So let me ask you this this morning. Knowing these things in a people of church, and knowing who Christ is, are you 
a great cloud of witness. Let us consider those, the Scripture says, and let us set aside the sin that so easily besets us. The sins of the world. Folks, we can blame the world for everything, but it really boils down to us. Our own lusts or our own desires. The lust of the eye, the pride of life, and so on. Those things are the things that so easily beset us and cause us to sin. A sin that we cannot run the race that is set before us. What race? The race of salvation. The race of the gospel message. That it might be presented to the world. That others might receive the riches that you have received. Chapter 12, 12, verse 2. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, sometimes life gets hard. Life gets difficult. We've got to make tough choices. Even sometimes within our own families, we've got to make choices that that are for the Lord and for Him first that go contrary to our families, that go contrary to our lives, that go (coughs) completely contrary to what we want to do. And it's hard. It is. But consider what Jesus did. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Can anyone tell me what the joy was? Huh? Y'all don't be afraid to shout, I ain't. God. Huh? Oh, somebody just said. Salvation. God. For us. We were the joy. So Christ lived his life for you. For you. For me. Christ took the path to the cross for you and for me. We were and are His joy. Whenever times are hard and life gets tough and everything seems to be crushing in around us or we're even having to make choices that cut us to the quick, consider Him. Consider what He did, what He went through, and who He did it for. Verse 4. You have not yet resisted unto bloodshed, striving against sin. There are people in the world today who stand up for the name of Jesus and lose their life. They are standing up for the Lord. All the way to bloodshed. And we get a little beside ourselves whenever God asks us, well, don't watch that show. And we're like, I don't really like the show. If I miss this, I miss that. I don't know how it ends. So what? Who cares? (laughs) You know what I'm saying? We we get so beside ourselves on such little things. And I could come up with all kinds of examples. But you know what? I don't need to. Because the unction of the Holy Spirit directs each and every one of us every day of our life. And if we will listen to Him and heed to His call, He will tell us that which we should and we shouldn't do. And we will answer that call for the joy that is set before us. What is that joy? Some of us, well, don't answer that. Some of us might say the eternal kingdom. That's a good benefit. Yeah. Eternal life. That is a good benefit. Uh, the Holy Ghost. That's a wonderful benefit. But who is the joy? The God who so loved the world that he gave his son that we might have life. He is our joy. We've got to be joyous for God and for who He is and the Son that He sent that we might have life. That begins the relationship. If our riches, listen, if our riches are solely what we can get, it sounds a whole lot like our worldly riches. If it's so I can get into the kingdom, if it's so I can live forever, if it's so I can be happy because I'm tired of being sad here and so forth and so on, that is not a relationship of a of a true relationship, it's of things. Our joy should be the same joy that was a joy for us, that Christ loved us. And our joy should be Him. It changes things. We're not doing it just for what we can get. We're doing it because of the person who gave it to us. It changes things. Whenever we count Him as our riches as He counted us as His. 
Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. We're going to talk a little bit about what it is. And if you need a sermon title today, it's going to be Christian Stewardship. <coughs> Meaning, be a Christian. One who says you are a follower of Christ, then follow Him. And for the riches that He has given us, let us be a good steward of those riches. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. It says, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one for another, one for another. Love as the brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. Whose mind do you suppose we should be of? And speak loud, church. The mind of Christ. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. There's something different about true Christians. Now, why should I have to even say true before Christian? Because there's a lot of people who call themselves Christians that, folks, they just literally are not. They are not the definition of the word itself. They are not Christ followers. How do you know this? By their fruits. You will know. Is that not true? It is very true. So this is for true Christians. How many of us in the, in, in the room, and you don't need to answer these questions that way, because I'm going to put no way on the spot, unless I tell you. But anyway, how many of you in the room are guilty of actually doing this? Evil for evil. Someone comes against you, you go back. Now, you might say, well, no, I don't ever say that to their face, but what do you do behind your back? You're doing evil for evil, one way or another. What is the condition of your heart? Be considerate of Jesus. Jesus come to us. We were evil, and we did evil through Him. What did He do back? He said, I love you, I'm going to the cross for you. That's not evil back. Right? That is the exact opposite. That's going back uh, um, up to the verse 8 where it says, Be compassionate one to another, and love as the brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous, be like Christ. Verse 10, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips, that they speak no guile. We speak so much hardship into our lives, it is ridiculous. We spend so much time looking at what we don't have and what's going wrong and who did this and who did that and all these types of things that we don't even have no room for the blessings of God because we've called them completely out of our lives. If you will seek the face of God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, what does He bring? The fruits of the Spirit, which are what? Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness. All of these things that actually everyone in the room, if you were honest, desire, search for, want, seek, go after. I know you do because we do it with our worldly riches. You can look at our worldly riches and what we try to achieve and what we try to gain and you can see how you're trying to plug different holes in your life of all the things that God can give you if you will seek His face. And you know why we keep trying to get more and more and more even after we get what we want or what we think we need? Because it does not last. It does not satisfy. It's time for us as a church to, to rise up and to know our Savior on a personal level, not for what we can get, but, what, but for the love that we can give back because He's already loved us. Amen. Speak good things into your life, folks. Amen. Speak salvation. Speak the love of God. For God so loved me that He gave His Son that I might have life and life more abundantly now and in the kingdom to come. Verse 11, Let us eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. How many of us, if we were honest, would consider peace to be achieved in our lives? If everyone knew that we were the best, we were right, everyone else was wrong, and I'm on top. 
Uh-huh. Everyone bows to me, listens to me, understands what I say. There's no conflict. That's peace to me. Well, guess what? Not everybody can have that. But we can't have peace in God. Let us eschew evil and do good. Let us seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and the ear and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now you know what? I am extremely thankful for the first part of that verse. How many of you are thankful that God hears your prayers? His ears are open to your thoughts and your intents of your heart. He knows before you ask. That's where we might run into a wall. He knows the intents of your heart, and He also knows before you ask. And if a heart is full of evil and contention and hatred and spite and so forth and so on, there's a problem. Verse 13, And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Okay. This one may take a little bit of unpacking here because let's just say that we are a person who is a true Christian and we're following after God. And we can even use some of the apostles as examples. Let's just do that. Some of them go into a city and they're spreading the gospel message. Their hearts are full of joy. They're full of the Holy Spirit. They're powerful. They're speaking God's word. And there are those in the crowds whose hearts are being moved. But there's also those in the crowds whose hearts are hard. And they begin to approach them and throw stones at them and to beat them and eventually throw some of them in prison. And then we read a verse like this that says this. And who is he that will harm you? If you be a follower of that which is good. Well, it sounds like you're getting hard. Folks, we as Christians need to do some, and this is probably homework with kids. I can't get really deep into today. We need to be able to dif- differentiate between flesh and spirit. Okay? Fleshly, they are being harmed. I am guarantee there's bruises and cuts and bleeding and sores and so forth and so on. But then they find themselves in prison and they've not been harmed. Spiritually. Because they're sitting there in prison and shackles and chains with all these physical ailments and things that's going on, but they're praising God. And they are not harmed. Their riches, allude to where we'll finally wind up, are not of this world. And they are so not a part of this world that that includes their body. Their riches are in heaven. Their riches are in God. Their riches are in Christ. Verse 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteous sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Be, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh ye a reason for the hope that is, that is in you with meekness and fear. Are you ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within? Someone comes along and and sees your life and what's going on and what scenario can we build? Um, You just lost your job. You're down to your last hundred dollars in the bank. Things are getting tight. Things are getting tough. And you're still praising God. And they come up to you and they say, why? Why? Your life is in shambles. You've lost your job. You're about to lose your house. You're way behind on your car payment. And you've only got $100 in the bank. And that's fixing to be for food. And it's going to be gone. Why are you the way you are? Because I believe in Christ. That's just one example. But I guarantee you in the room today, each one of us could build an example right now that we're going through that we might need to amp up our sanctification of the Lord in our heart. Meaning He's bigger than the problem that we have. He's the sustainer of us all. He's the one that can give us the strength to make it through anything. And if we don't, we have eternal life. Are you following along with me? 
We've got to sanctify the Lord in our heart to such a degree that He is the pinnacle of all. The Lord of all. The riches of our life. What verse are we on? Fourteen? Sixteen. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Who do you care? Whose opinion do you care about more? The worlds and those who surround you or the opinion of our Heavenly Father? Hopefully Him. Having a, okay, verse 17, For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sin in the, in the just sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, but, but put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit." There are many times in our lives as we walk for our Lord and Savior that we will be ridiculed. We will suffer for the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And some of the previous scriptures said we should count that as joy. But we know that He suffers just as much. How many of you believe that Jesus deserved what He got? Hopefully none of you. You can answer that. He did not deserve it. He was He who was without sin whose heart, mind, and life was after that which pleased the Father. And for His love for us, He died for our sins that we might have life. He suffered for the unjust. Verse 19, By which also He went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient when once in the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Which category are we in? Are we in the category of once we were disobedient? Or are we currently disobedient? What if we use the scenario that was laid out before us? In the days of Noah, when the ark was being built, guess what Noah was doing while he was building the ark? Can anybody tell me? Huh? He was preaching. What was he preaching? He was preaching salvation through water, which and all the figures and types and shadows and all this stuff, was the ark. And he preached, and he preached, and he preached, but nobody would listen. Thought he was crazy. They would rather be in their disobedient lives than listen to the obedience of Noah through the inspiration of God. And it was only him and his family, those who worked on the ark, that made it. Life is tough. And the world pressing in on us the way that it does is difficult. But count it for joy for the sufferings of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for the joy that is set before you. See, the point is to find the true riches. And the true riches is Christ. To love Him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might that you might love Him that to the saving of your soul, that you might love others. Verse 22, Who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him. That's one of those verses that you kind of read over and you go, okay, that's good. Think about it for a minute. And even think about our arrogance. It said that Jesus has gone and sit down at the right hand of the Father. And He is so majestic. 
And he is so great, so powerful at the right hand of his, of his father that even the angels and the powers and the authority <coughs> reverence him. Think about that, okay? They are his joy. They are his riches. He is the king, the prince of peace, Lord of lords, son of God, risen from the dead. And they reverence him. Now we as humans who know all these things, how do we treat that joy that should be set before us? How do we treat him who we are his joy, who went to the cross for us? Is he as rich to us as we he as we are to him? Yeah. I hope so, brother. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes the truth shall be spoken. The faith of the little ones. Let's go to First Peter, continuing in First Peter. Well, we're going to skip down to four, chapter four here, verse one. It says, "For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh." Arm yourselves likewise with this same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Arming ourselves with the same mind. How many of the room have completely... Don't raise your hand. How many of you in the room have completely ceased from sin? Well, let's use the excuse, okay? Well, none of us can. None of us can live sinless. We are trapped in this world and this fleshly body condemned to what it does and so forth and so on. Not true. By the power of the blood of Jesus, Apostle Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I do live. But the life that I now live, I live by the name of the Son of God, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You might fall, like Apostle Paul said. You might have hard times. But it's not your goal. Listen to me. It's not your purpose. It's not your joy. It's not your mission. It's not your crutch. It's not your excuse. Unfortunately, it happens. That's how it should be looked upon. But folks, too often do we use this type of an excuse to give us the way out. When someone comes against us and we do evil for evil, we say, well, that's just my natural fleshly reaction. And yes, that's the problem. And sometimes it may come at us so hard that we do fall and we make a mistake and we go back evil for evil. But it shouldn't be the norm. Amen. You understand what I'm saying? Because the joy that is set before you is not your pride. It's not that you're right, you're wrong, so forth and so on. The joy that is set before you is the same Christ that loves all of us, that we might glorify Him and not ourselves. For if He can do it, I know I can. Because He's given me that power. So folks, as we have seen Christ suffer in the flesh and have things done to him that he did not deserve for us. Let us be a true Christian who has ceased from sin. It's not a tall order. It's not something you can't do. It's something you can do through Christ which strengtheneth you. Verse 2, That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness and lust and excess of wine and reveling and banqueting and abominable idols, wherein they think it's... Now, let me pause for a second. All those things that we were just listed there, those, those might be things of our past. Things that we used to do. Things when we were not Christian, Christ followers. But now that we have become Christians, now that we are Christ followers, and the joy of Christ, the riches of Christ that are set before us, we no longer do these things. We're different. 
Remember in the previous verses that we read, whenever we act different than the world and we are in hope and entrusted in the Lord and we are going through life and people come up to us and ask us, how are you? We give them the answer because Christ is in me, the hope of glory. I've been translated into the kingdom of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My riches are not of this world, but of the kingdom. And that which I toil and work and try for, I lay those riches up in heaven. That's the hope that is within me. And you can take my life, you can take my cars, you can take my house, you can take my family, you can take everything I got. You can take me plumb to the grave, but you cannot take my salvation in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That is the hope, that is the joy that is beset within us. And because we are no longer that old man which had no hope, our riches are not tied to this world, but tied to God. We no longer live in those things. In verse 4, this is what happens. Wherein they think it's strange that you not run with them to the same excess of riot. Speak evil of you. You mean you don't do this? And you don't watch that? And you don't go here? And it should just go on and on and on. You go, yeah, you know why? Because I have a God who has called me out of that unpeace. I see you probably not have ever heard it said like that. You might have heard unrighteousness, call me out of that sin, call me out of that filthiness. But do you remember earlier in the scriptures where it said, those who want peace should ensue it? Those who want peace should seek it? Those who want peace should seek Christ. And some oftentimes, those people who are coming at you and saying, why are you doing this with me and doing this and doing that? And you go, because, you know what? I really would like to be honest with you right now. Because I look at your life and you really don't have any peace. You really don't have any joy. You really don't have any hope. You really don't have any purpose. And we don't want to be rude and say that. But we step back and we go, I have a joy that is set before me, riches that are before me, and they are Christ. And I am at peace with the fact that I don't do these things in the world. And I can lay down at night and be happy with my Savior and the salvation that I have. Do you? Can you? You know, I think sometimes if we would get real with people, as I'm really feeling I should, and we should get real with ourselves. It might save their life, but we, we pander and we hold back. And who was it last night at the fireside said there's no room for political correctness in that Bill Calvin? In all honesty, there isn't. Because political correctness in the church kills people. If you want to test that theory, look at our nation. It's killing our nation. Verse 5. Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. There will be a day of judgment. There will be a time when we stand before the Lord. And you will judge the quick and the dead. You who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and accept Him as your Savior, you are those who are quickened. Quickened by His Spirit and made alive. So what is your purpose? It just told us to take the gospel message to those who are dead. That on the day of judgment, they might receive life. Just as you have. A room for compassion, like if we go back to 1 Peter chapter 3, 8, where we read that, having compassion one to another, love is the brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil and railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing. What's the intent and purpose of our heart? What is the joy that's said before us? What are the riches that are in our soul? It is those of compassion that our Savior had on us that we have towards us. Those are our riches. There are four that I like to repeat often to myself, and it helps keep myself in check. I need to repeat it even more. It is love, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Remember the four. 
They're, they're, they are magnificent in helping you with all ways of life. Anything you approach, any situation you find yourself in, am I loving? Am I showing grace? Am I merciful? Am I forgiving? If you can do those things in any situation in your life, I can almost guarantee you, I should just say, I can guarantee you, you are being like Christ. Because He loved me, He had grace on me, He forgave me, and He had mercy. Those are the things of the mind of Christ, I believe. I want to touch on one thing I mentioned earlier in verse 6. It says, the latter part, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but living according to God in the Spirit. Folks, we've got to be able to discern the things of the flesh and the things of the Spirit, that we might rightly understand God's Word first and foremost, but that we also might rightly understand how to approach things in life. Because there are going to be things that hurt our flesh, but nothing can hurt our spirit. Verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Okay, and this is where I need you to church to, to answer honest, honestly with me. And I want, I, want, I want you to all say yes or no, no to the answer to this question. And I want you to be honest because I, I want the census. I want to know what the answer of this is. So after I ask the question... Immediately say yes or no. I want to know. And say it loud so we can hear it. Will you do that for me, church? Yes. yes. Okay. Now, read the verse again. I'm going to ask the question. Everybody may answer immediately. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Is it your sins? Yes. yes. Okay. Let's look at it a different way. If someone has wronged you, situation in life, whatever the case may be, I don't want to build a scenario. They've come against you and you um, approach them in the same way. You do evil for evil. Nothing good happens. But they come to you and they're evil against you, but you give them Christ back. Whose sin shall be covered? Theirs. Theirs. You didn't give evil for evil. Remember, you gave evil for good, to be good. So then their sins are covered by grace, by mercy, by forgiveness. The exact same thing that Christ gave us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. He gave us grace. He covered our sins with His blood. Yes, we have to receive it, but He gave it to us first. So as you've read this scripture, like I have for so many years, understand there's another perspective. Yes, your sins are covered by the grace, mercy, love, and forgiveness of Jesus. Especially if we practice those things. But folks, if we be like Christ, we can cover a multitude of sins of others. Not that we have the power in ourselves, don't take me wrong. But we just might give an opportunity for someone to receive Jesus. Does that make sense? I think it's a beautiful thing in the Scripture. Verse 9. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Sometimes that's hard. We know we should show hospitality, and we know we should act this way, and we know we should do this, and we do it because we have to. One day I want to come for myself and for the church. I want to do what Christ wants me to do because... Did you know that Christ went to the cross because he wanted to? Think about that. He went to go hang on a cruel tree by the nails. I couldn't even imagine that. But he wanted to. He didn't go there, ah, I gotta do this because dad told me to. You know, and all these sinners, they've got to have some way out of this, so I guess I'll go to the cross. That's not how he went. He went because he wanted to. Folks, we've got to serve God because we want to. Amen. Because we love Him. Because He is our joy. Because He is our riches. He is our treasure in heaven. I'm almost done. Verse 10. As every man hath received the gift, 
even so minister the same one to another. You've not been given this gift just for your blessedness. You've been given this gift to bless others, to give them the right to life that you have had and that you have. We don't hide it under a bushel. No, we sang that song as children. And here we are as adults, not even able to fulfill the lyrics of a song we sang as children. We've been given the gospel message for a reason to share it with others. Some of us said that, well, I share it without even a word. And I, that is true. And I think that is a good way to share it. But make sure your witness is strong. If you don't want to use any words. Make sure your witness is strong. Okay. As a good steward of the manifold grace of God, God has given you something to do something with. And to hide it, it's a shame. There's a parable about that if you want to look it up. The one who went and hid it. See what it says. Last verse of the day. Or from me at this time. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Does that scare anybody? As the oracles of God? That's so big. That's so majestic. That's so, that's so wise. I, I can't. Calm down. It's okay. Listen to what the scripture says, okay? Don't get all worked up. If any man minister. I, I'm not a minister. It's okay. Calm down. Don't worry about it. Listen to what the scripture says. Let him do as of the ability which God giveth. Oh, okay. Really, you should take a sigh of relief at that, okay? You really should. Because God gives you the ability to do all things, to minister, to know the oracles of God, to be able to share the oracles of God, the deep good things of God, or even the shallow little bitty things of the milk of the Word of God. Resurrection of the dead and the salvation of Jesus Christ. I hope that everybody in the room right now who calls himself a Christian, and if you don't, go home and study. I hope everybody in the room today that calls themselves Christian can share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, this is where I feel like I should be politically correct. That's what I said we should. If you can't be ashamed, go home and fix it. Amen. That's not good. But if you would help me out that I don't feel bad that I said that. If you believe that, would you raise your hand? Praise God, no, I'm not, I'm not alone. <laughs> now, this is the good part. That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Does the God of our riches have that place in our heart? Is He the God of glory in all things in our lives? Is he, is he the one to be praised for He has the dominion of our life? Is He the King that sits on the throne of our hearts? Is He our Lord and Lords? Is He the risen Son of God to us? I pray that these scriptures that we have went over today will encourage you if we need to, to switch our motivation in life from the riches of this world to the riches that God has given unto us. And if you need to recap, four of the big ones. Mercy, grace, love, and forgiveness. And by His Holy Spirit, we can do all things through Christ which strengthen us. I think we'll close with prayer this morning. Um, does anybody have a song prepared to close with? All right. Let's give those who are preparing for lunch about 20, 30 minutes. And then uh, we'll go over say, and uh, have lunch after that. So let's all stand and we'll close with prayer this morning. <laughs> You know, oftentimes, um, <clears throat> some folks ask me afterwards, why didn't you have an altar? And you know, the altar is always open. 
And uh, even if the moment is not right now, I have confidence that there's people here today who would be happy to pray with you and to share with you and to share God's word with you and to answer questions and to lead you down the path of salvation through Jesus Christ. Or just to be a shoulder to lay on and to, to, to you know, like cast some care that they might pray with you and help you through those times. But as we close in prayer, if you need prayer, it's all over. What's that?